Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to the channel. Before we get into it, I have to say, if you see me swatting at my face, it's because there's a million tiny gnats right now out in Utah and it's, uh, they're getting all up in my business. So, a couple weeks ago you may have noticed I posted a review of a pretty weird, interesting telescope design, a 81 millimeter refractor that had a strange internal focusing mechanism just like a camera lens does. Now, I have its little brother here for a review. This is the William Optics Redcat 61 Petzval OTA WIFD. Whole lot of numbers, whole lot of acronyms. This is a full frame designed refractor telescope which behaves equally like a camera lens due to its internal focusing mechanism that we're going to be running tonight with my little ZWO camera out in uh, Kanab, Utah some of the darkest skies in America and I'm at a nice Airbnb so it's going to be hopefully a really nice experience if it doesn't get too windy tonight and if the gnats will go away. There's a lot of gnats out here. Yeah this is like a classical evolution of the Red Cat telescope uh, but instead of having the helical focuser it's got the cool new uh, internal focusing mechanism which I'm a big fan of because honestly the only reason I never got a Red Cat is because I don't like helical focusers unless it's for a Rocanon 135 in which case it's the greatest optical element ever made and I'll deal with it for that but with the telescope I wasn't really ever attracted to helical focusers but now the Red Cat doesn't have one it's got a normal style focuser so it'll be really nice uh, to see how this little guy does optically I've got the uh, 183 on the back of it so even though this thing has a short focal length of like 330 millimeters, it's actually going to have a ton of resolution uh, around like an arc second per pixel with these tiny little pixels. So it's pretty much the perfect uh, combination uh, for doing some images. And I'm probably going to be shooting the Lagoon and Trifid, just keeping it simple. And we'll shoot something nice and bright in one night and hopefully get a pretty awesome result to uh, show you guys. Anyways, we're all set up. Uh, we just have to wait until dark now, so I'm going to give you some b-roll shots of the scope, maybe talk about it a little bit, and then we will cut until dark time uh, when we will start taking our photos. Alright, before we get into the rest of the video, uh, my financial disclosure for these products is no one has paid me anything for any of this stuff. Uh, William Optics sent me the scope for review, and Gina sent me the Eagle for review. Everything else I had to pay for with my old hard-earned money. Uh, in light of that, there are affiliate links for the products in the video, and if you decide to get one, then I get like a tiny commission off of it, which I think is fair given I spent a bunch of money and gas to get here in time to come out and film this video. So if you like the telescope, I get a little money for it, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In light of it, I'm going to be giving you a uh, an honest review. You know I like to keep it real. Uh, if I don't like something, I will talk about it, and you will know for sure. Venus. Well, it looks like it's gearing up to be like a literally perfect night. No wind, no clouds, and it's warm because it's June. So this is just going to be absolutely great because I can't stand the cold. I grew up in Phoenix. I don't do cold. I'm an absolute wimp when it comes to that. But it also sounds like an ASMR video out here. I don't know if you can hear all the crickets, but this really adds to the vibe and I'm actually looking forward to stargazing tonight. I haven't seen the Milky Way in maybe two months or so, so it's going to be like an absolutely pleasant night to sit out on the porch of this Airbnb and just watch the stars. But before we get into that, I just wanted to maybe talk about what I'm going to shoot, why I'm going to shoot it, and uh, what it is. And I'm going to have to break out my phone here because I don't know anything about space. Uh, I'll tell you what I do know off the top of my head and then later Brain will give you some facts. So I'm going for the Lagoon and the Trifid Nebula. Now, I know I shoot a lot of off-the-cuff things, but uh, those things aren't suited for making a YouTube review. So we're going to do something nice and bright, something that's going to, you know, at least deliver us a nice pretty photo. And that is going to be the Lagoon and the Trifid Nebula. It's one of the brightest nebula in the sky, probably the brightest in the summertime sky here in the northern hemisphere. And it's a bright star forming region in Sagittarius uh, and with the field of view of this telescope there will be of course the Trifid which is Messier 20 and the Lagoon which is Messier 8 and some of the surrounding um, I think it's like a SH2 or an IC nebula that comes around with all of them 
Anyways, star forming regions, those are caused by young stars being born. The intense radiation from these stars as they come to life ionizes the surrounding gas through the photoelectric effect. This radiation causes their electron levels to change and eject out a photon of a certain color. Now, there's lots of different gases in space and nebulas as such can take on a whole bunch of different colors. You know, there's the, the bright pink, there's a lot of, you know, teal colored ones, oxygen three nebula, there's sulfur two, also deep red. Uh, but the most prevalent, of course, is the hydrogen nebulae from the hydrogen alpha emission that show up in a night sky as a deep red hue. Now, this is, of course, because hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe, so it's going to be the most abundant narrowband gas. And because, you know, it's so prevalent, a lot of objects that show up in HA are really bright, and the lagoon and the trifid are uh, no exception to this. They are very, very bright red, and they are very easy to pick up with maybe only, you know, short exposure times, like one night. Now, I'm out in Kanab, which it's incredibly dark here, uh, some of the darkest skies in America. So that, combined with the fact that we have a super bright nebula, should, you know, give us a nice pretty image to uh, see what this telescope is capable of. I'm not going to shoot flats tonight, and I know that's really off character for me, but I kind of want to see what the vignetting's like, so I probably won't do any flats. <laughs> Anyways, let me bump my exposure up. It's getting dark, man. You know what they say. Gradually and then suddenly, and it's definitely that way when it comes to how bright the night sky is. Anyways, there's the lagoon and the trifid nebula. So the trifid, I think, is a bit more interesting than the lagoon because it has a reflection nebula, which is the bright blue next to it. It has the emission nebula, which is the great pink, and it has an absorption nebula, which comes in the form of the dark bands that sit over the top of the trifid. And it's just it's just gorgeous. It's really cool if you have a ton of focal length as well. If you've got a big telescope, it's just absolutely amazing. A bit cooler and a lot easier to edit than the Lagoon. The Lagoon, I'm getting eaten alive. The Lagoon is also cool, um, even at higher focal lengths, uh, but it's very difficult to edit in such a way. I like it more as like a wide field target because it's just simpler to edit. Uh, those of you who have done a full in on the lagoon will know what I mean. It's a bit of a challenge. Anyways, this telescope will have a focal length of 330 millimeters, and my camera is an ASI 183, which is, I think, a micro four thirds format. So it's actually gonna be pretty close in, and I didn't even check my framing. Uh, we're gonna be doing that on the fly. So I'm not sure if it's gonna fit both. I think it's gonna fit both, but with this little package and these small pixels, I should get a ton of resolution, and we should actually be able to get a pretty cool looking photo. Now, my challenge for tonight is going to be, uh, I'm not going to be able to polar line because Polaris is behind this Airbnb and I needed a place where I could string together a bunch of extension cords uh, to actually have AC power. So I'll show you my janky setup for that. It's going to be very janky. Um, but I hope the HGM27 is up to it. The HGM27 is kind of a weird mount. My guiding is pretty weird on it too, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, we're just gonna chill out here and wait for dark. I'm going to uh, enjoy the ambience. We going to M8. So as we wait here for the uh, the cover of night to come over us. I just kind of feel something important to mention. Gear is not as important as you think it is in astrophotography. Yes, it does play a huge role, especially if you're going for more unique results, but I could take any telescope out to skies like this and produce a good photo, you know what I mean? There's no substitute for dark, crystal clear skies. Let's say we put my Takahashi in the middle of London. It's never gonna work out, right? But let's say I bring out a, you know, $500 doublet out here to Kanab. I could take some great images. I think there's a huge focus of talking about the gear, the gear, the gear, and you could probably do quite well with what you have if you just brought it 
somewhere with darker skies, uh, somewhere with better seeing. Never underestimate the, the importance of your location. We are on target right now. I'm running everything off of my, uh, my little cell phone here through the Eagle computer. And I've got my camera running in stop motion mode so you can see what's going on behind me because, <laughs> man, uh, you couldn't ask for uh, a better night or a better spot to be shooting photos. And I actually barely managed to scoot this scope far enough back to where I could kind of polar align it. So we're actually getting not the worst guiding on the face of the earth, but it is, it is dark out here. And I'm about to get my first uh, frame in on the, on the object and we'll see what our uh, rotation is like. It looks like we're actually not gonna be fitting uh, the Trifid Nebula into the shot. It is so zoomed in that, wow, unless I reframe. All right, so I eventually decided I should suck it up and use the built-in rotator on the Red Cat to actually do my rotation. So here you see me fiddling around with it. It was actually really quick, just with looping exposures in Nina to just spin the camera over to where it had to go to fit both the Trifit and the Lagoon into the shot. Didn't take me very long at all. Anyways, after this was done, I just let the camera run for the entirety of the night, and I finished up with about 90 three-minute exposures. Hey guys, so I made it back from Kanab. I loaded up all my data, and I have produced a very nice finished image that I wanted to go through and share with you, and we can talk about what's going on in it and what we think of the final image. Now this is, of course, the image we talked about shooting, the classic Lagoon and Trifid. Now, I was actually really lazy with editing this. Uh, there's no flats, there's no darks, there's no bias, and as such, with the 183, we did have to fight a little bit of amp glow, and we can see the smallest bit of evidence of this on the left, but that I would just crop out for when I posted to social media. Anyways, uh, let's just zoom in here and look at the photo. Now I did give this a very light application of Blur Exterminator for those curious, uh, nothing extreme, but we can see we did manage to get quite a bit of good detail in this shot. Um, I've done zero noise reduction, a uh, pretty light uh, pass over for this whole image. Uh, the technical details are, I, I got about 30 images, uh, three minute exposures each for R, G, and B. This is a, a mono image, but we can see uh, things are looking good in the corners of this whole shot. And there's not really any chromatic aberration, which is really great. So, I mean, overall, this looks to me like a pretty nice result. Uh, it's a shame I don't have a full frame camera to test this with, but actually I do. I have DSLRs. I just don't feel like using a DSLR to shoot Astro because it's not very ideal. However, we can see we got some really great details out of this and it's just a nice little small scope. Here is the, uh, the Trifid. You can see here why they call it the Trifid. It's got the three types of nebula I was mentioning earlier, the blue, the pink, and the dark bands, and we can also see quite a lot of nice detail in the Lagoon HA emission region, which is pretty awesome. Now, in terms of focusing, uh, thermal stability, that kind of stuff, the focusing is very easy. I can show you my raw frames here in the blink so that we can demonstrate the focus stability. Here are all my red frames. Let's blow this up so you guys can get a closer look at it. You can see a couple tracking issues here and then with the HEM, but you can see where I've refocused and towards the end. So in Kanab, big temperature swing. There's a little bit of focus change, but nothing extreme. Uh, we can even see a band of air glow pass through, which is pretty neat. I'm sure you'll, you've will you seen this on the time lapse, or you will see it on the time lapse that uh, that big aeroglow band held up pretty well throughout the the whole capture process and I suppose now just some final words about the build quality 
Uh, again, the same problem with the 81 uh, WIFD with the focus lock being on the bottom of the dovetail plate. You can't really lock the focus knob. Again, kind of a non-issue because there's no load on the focus. So, you know, what's the point of having a focus lock if your focuser is not going to move at all? It seems kind of redundant to have it there, but a little bit hard to reach. For the rest of the build quality, it's all really nice metal. Um, it comes with a Batnov mask. A little saddle for the little guide scope thing very nice it held up very nice for the guiding uh, and the whole imaging session the scopes a little heavy uh, given that it's like it's built like a tank so it might be a little heavier than you're used to expecting for a 61 millimeter refractor but I personally don't mind a little extra weight I'm using a mount that can handle it so I'm okay with the scope having a bit of a more tanky build to it so the other nice thing, uh, the rotator itself was very nice to use. Uh, I'm sure you saw in the video, I had to change my rotation angle. Super nice to do on the fly. Um, it didn't mess up my focus at all because it's all rigid on the back there and you're not having to actually rotate a camera inside of a nose piece or anything like that. So holding focus during rotation is really great. Um, details were very nice. I mean, you can't really go wrong with this kind of a telescope. Um, the only downsides are it's a little heavy and you can't reach the focus lock. But other than that, it was really nice. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoy the final image and I will catch you all in the next one.